And to prevent any disruptive chat, we will open the chat later on in the meeting only to host. So you can direct your questions to the host and then we'll pass those on to Graham to actually direct it to the various panelists. So over to you, Graham. Great. Thanks very much, Wendy, and uh, welcome to everybody to this week's uh, COVID-19 Echo Clinic uh, hosted by the Department of Medicine of the University of Cape Town. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined us previously, we have a, a standard format uh, for these webinars, which involves um, a brief update on the epidemic in the Western Cape, uh, followed by our main speaker, and then after that, a, a panel discussion um, that the panel poses questions and uh, is involved in discussion with the speaker around the topic. Um, so to start off with, uh, I'd like to introduce Andrew Bull. Andrew is from the Western Cape Department of Health uh, and the UCT School of Public Health. And he's going to give us a brief update on the surveillance of COVID-19 in the Western Cape province. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, can you hear me? Andrew, we can hear you loudly, please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Um, right, th thanks very much for the, for the opportunity to, to give a short update on behalf of myself and uh, Mary Ann Davies. We've been alternating with uh, in doing this. So, I can put the slide to refresh. Um, I've just taken today's update off the um, uh, provincial dashboard. Uh, you can see the, the overall case numbers um, of 6,700 diagnosed cases. Um, 117 cum cumulative deaths, and um, if you look at the pattern of of increase in in, in the case numbers, it's 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 been uh, consistently steep over the last over the last week. I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on the dif differences between localities because if you take the different metro subdistricts and and filter on them, one gets pretty much the same the same pattern of increase over over the last period, which substantiates the point we've made. In successive weeks about this being uh, fairly generalized across across the Western Cape. So just to look at some of the, uh, the, the, the update on the clinical issues. So uh, we've been tracking the uh, admissions and, and, and deaths from, from COVID. And one of the uh, issues is in the last couple of days, you've seen a, a slightly fewer admissions. And I wanted to raise it on this call because, because I, I realize there's quite a lot of um, uh, people from the clinical platform. We're going to be very dependent on data from the administrative systems in the weeks and months ahead because the uh, very thorough and detailed job that the communicable disease colleagues have been doing in contacting every hospital to find out about admissions and, and deaths, that will not be able to be sustained and we will be almost wholly reliant on, on what gets entered clerically. So it's an appeal to, to, to work with your clerical staff and your, your management staff to try and make sure that in these times of quite constrained resourcing, we do protect the, um, the clerical work that's happening around the COVID um, admissions and, and, and separations. The age distribution of pa patients being admitted and patients dying, the turquoise and the black is, is pretty much what we've been seeing all along, um, perhaps becoming more um, stable as, as, as we would expect. And the mortality from patients um, admitted to ICU, which is, um, which, which is the, uh, the pink and red bars, is uh, two thirds still in the public sector and mortality in general ward is running at, at 15 to 20%. And that also has been pretty much unchanged since the last time I presented these data. Uh, 
the proportion of patients who've died who've had HIV is sitting at, at uh, 18 out of 111 or 17%, and um, of a very high proportion who have diabetes, and which is relevant to today's uh, input. Um, Marianne will present a detailed multivariable analysis of the factors associated with mortality in the next presentation, but uh, we estimate that the independent impact of diabetes after accounting for age and other factors is about a fourfold increase in mortality amongst, amongst uh, the cohort so far. Looking at the testing data, so we, we um, have seen this grad, this not so gradual, but this constant increase in the um, proportion of tests that are positive in line with the evolving epidemic and, um, and a more clinically focused testing. Um, but even in the community screening and testing, the light green line, we've seen a very high um, uh, proportion um, coming back positive, which has alarmed uh, um, many people, including our national colleagues. Um, We've made a lot about the testing being targeted and you can see that the testing sites are where we know that there are also lots of cases coming through. Um, so we are testing in, the, uh, in, the, in those locations. Um, although overall, only a small percentage of patients who get screened end up symptomatic and getting tested so that this testing doesn't reflect community prevalence, but rather prevalence amongst those uh, with symptoms, um, that proportion is, uh, uh, is approaching seven and a half, eight percent sometimes in the metro. So it can mean that uh, up to two percent cross-sectionally are um, do have COVID in the in, in some of the um, outreach uh, community screening and testing uh, um, efforts. And now maybe just to comment as well on the laboratory turnaround time. Um, the because it's become a pain point for our clinical services is that in the last week the NHLS independently have estimated a five-day average uh, turnaround and on our and that concurs uh, quite well with what with what we're measuring on the data that's that's coming through to us. Getting on to the um, talking about the epidemic in the Western Cape uh, we've had a visit from the national minister in the week and we have a visit from the president at the end of the week um, identifying the Western Cape as a location of higher transmission and of concern around the national um, uh, outbreak response. So some of the explanations for the increased uh, cases and mortality could be that we measure things differently in the Western Cape and it's very tempting to, to fall back on that but having spoken to colleagues in other provinces who are fairly confident that they are not missing uh, COVID-related deaths, or not at this early stage anyway. The, uh, um, we have to uh, acknowledge that the, we do have more um, COVID-related uh, deaths in the Western Cape. We've got, um, so to try and uh, explain that, um, one of the, explanations is that we could have started earlier with the high levels of tourism and opportunities for uh, seeding uh, infection into, into the community and community infection, which may have been taking place long before we were aware of it. And in fact, some of the earliest hospital admissions uh, that we were aware of were in people who had no knowledge of having been exposed to any traveler or any, or any known case. Um, and that, so that could have accounted for both an earlier start and an earlier or, 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 or more um, cross uh, seeding events. Um, we may also have had uh, higher ongoing transmission. There's been a lot of description of these clusters, workplace and retail clusters, which may have uh, accelerated transmission in those early, in those early stages. So the, this graph is one which many, which is often presented uh, on uh, globally as cross-country comparisons of evolution in mortality after the first uh, X number of deaths have been recorded. We we plotted here from the time from ten, at the first ten deaths, and the dark blue line is the is the Western Cape, and the orange line is South Africa inclusive of the Western Cape. And the green line is South Africa, uh, excluding the Western Cape. So remembering that the, the x-axis is days since re reaching 10 
that's not uh, it's, it's not the same timeline, not the same calendar timeline for for each for each of these lines, but it does show whether the evolution having got to a certain point is differing. Um, and what we can see is that the um, the doubling time for the Western Cape for quite a long time was about eight days. This is the doubling time in mortality. It may have dropped off to about 12 days in the, just in the last while, but bear in mind that there may have been a delayed ascertainment of some of the, some of the events. The South African and the South African minus Western Cape lines haven't been updated for, for a couple of days. Um, but at a similar uh, at a similar point in terms of uh, a cumul cumulative mortality, uh, South Africa as a whole, inclusive of the Western Cape, wasn't that different. But it could have been argued that the um, taking the Western Cape out, that the doubling time was slightly longer uh, in the in the in the rest of the country. So what that tells us is is um, these lines are not that different. Um, and in fact, if you look at the last at the tail, and I've just calculated it for South Africa as, as a whole, and um, the doubling time right now in a calendar, from a calendar perspective is actually not that different. Um, there is evidence that uh, there was a time when the Western Cape was uh, seeing a faster growth in mortality and by extrapolation, therefore, infections sometime prior to that. Um, but a large part, but but a large part of these differences may have been explained by what happened prior, prior to getting to this point. Um, for comparison, Teng only got to the got onto this would only get onto this graph two weeks after the Western Cape, um, and two weeks from now, looking where Teng is might be a better way to reflect on whether the transmission dynamics subsequent to the early period have been different. And then finally, just to talk about what we're diagnosing relative to what we think the number of the, what the case burden is. If we currently have five or more deaths a day and we work backwards and uh, um, lots of people use a case fatality of 1% after restricting to symptomatic patients and there's some debate as to what proportion of symptomatic versus asymptomatic. But working, working backwards from that, at some time in the past, anywhere between between maybe eight and 12 days or, or even longer, um, we would have expected the same number of, of patients uh, who, are, who are on average dying today to on average be infected back then multiplied by uh, one over the case fatality rate. And doing those sums and then accounting for the doubling time, we would be expecting about 4,000 or more new infections every day at the moment. So that's, that's just coming from arithmetic, not any com complex mathematical model. Um, and relative to that, we're diagnosing 300, 350 to 500, more on some days, less on other days, new cases at the moment. So our diagnosed fraction at the moment is probably one in 10 or less. And that has relevance to how impactful the contact tracing and outbreak response is, and also the utilization of a community testing um, uh, approach. Uh, and, and maybe to mention that letting go of making that transition is a difficult transition to make as a health department uh, because it means letting go of one of the tenets of, of, of outbreak control. Um, and flipping this onto, the, onto what the models would show, um, the models would show something very, very similar. If we continue to sustain that, that pattern, then we would expect in the current week, starting Sunday this week, uh, this past week, 450 admissions and another 75 deaths in the in, in the week period. Uh, we're seeing less than that so far over the first three days, but we'll have to discern over time how long our lag is in terms of ascertainment and whether the these diff whether we're always going to see a proximal uh, difference in actuals versus expectation. And uh, uh, that's all I'll I'll present for for today. We're going to take questions at the end, Graham, or no? Thanks, thanks, yeah. Andrew. I was just uh, un unmuting myself. So, but it was re it's again really incredible to see such a rich data set uh, from from our local experience and, and really up to date, right up to date uh, in real time to up to today. Um, so, Andrew, I'm just uh, I'll just ask one question, and that is just a practical one. Um, you, you mentioned the importance of clinicians ensuring that the data 
is, is, is being entered in such a way that's accessible to you at the data center. And I just wondered, um, you know, what does that entail? Uh, does it mean the ICD-10 coding or, or ensuring that, that the diagnosis is entered on the system? What, what can we do to assist in that regard? So I think it operates at a couple of levels. Firstly, just the um, administrative, administratively separating patients uh, uh, from, from the wards when they're discharged or when they die so that we have knowledge of that. Um, otherwise, it overinflates the, the estimate of the number of beds in use. We know that the patients have COVID at the moment because we mostly have a laboratory diagnosis. But ICD-10 coding would also be useful, especially if we get to a point where we're having to make some uh, presumptive diagnoses. Uh, we don't yet have a waiver on filling in the notification forms. Uh, we are trying to argue that with the volume coming our way, it's not going to add any value nationally, but we haven't been given uh, a waiver yet. Um, yeah. And then for, for um, deaths, one of the phenomena that a few clinicians have reported to us is being asked by funeral homes to fill in death certificates that are brought to the, to the health facility. And of not, sometimes those deaths are on patients who've never been admitted. Mm -hmm. So we would have no knowledge, uh, no uh, administrative hook to know that, that about that outcome. And uh, what we would suggest initially until we can get an electronic system for those out of facility deaths is to maybe just let the communicable disease directorate know or ask the IPC nurse in the facility to let, let them know about that death. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, I'm sure there might be some questions towards the end. So if you, if you are able to stay on, that'd be great. Um, so uh, to, to move on to our, our uh, main talk this afternoon, um, as you heard from Andrew, that uh, in our local experience is, is very much coming to the fore that diabetes is a, uh, an important risk factor for mortality. And that's certainly reflected in the literature as well from multiple uh, settings that diabetes and obesity are risk factors for more severe COVID-19. Uh, and for mortality from the condition. And it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce my uh, colleague from Kruderski and UCT, Joel Dave, uh, who's going to give a, a talk on diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19, uh, really trying to tease out some of the data regarding the influence of, of diabetes and obesity on outcomes, as well as pr uh, provide some practical advice uh, on managing patients with diabetes and COVID-19. So Joel is the head of the Division of Endocrinology at Khrudeskia and UCT. Uh, his research has focused on the metabolic complications of antiretroviral therapy and the treatment of HIV. And he currently leads the Diabetes Stewardship Program at, at Khrudeskia Hospital, uh, which is a novel intervention that started in the last year. Uh, and just to also point out that uh, Joel is now working as a consultant uh, in the COVID service at, at Khrudeskia. And so this talk really comes from somebody who has a practical experience in the management of COVID uh, in, in our setting, as well as some of the, the practical issues of, of co-managing uh, the diabetes. Uh, so thanks very much for, for talking uh, today, Joel, and we really look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Graham. Can, Mark, can you hear me? We can hear you loudly and clearly, Joel, please go ahead. Great, thank you. So good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to thank Graham for inviting me to do this webinar today on the association of diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19. And uh, since there are over 450 million people globally living with diabetes, and about 650 million people worldwide that are obese, uh, the meeting of diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19 is bound to happen. Um, and it's not unprecedented that diabetes um, has some association with infectious disease, um, as we have all been trained to expect an increased risk of infections in patients with diabetes. And uh, if we have a look at another two current day epidemics, uh, namely TB and uh, HIV infection, uh, there's a strong association with diabetes. So you just one back there, Mark. One forward. <laughs> 
So if we just, if we, just a quick outline of my talk, uh, we're going to review whether there's actually an increased risk of infection and ALDS in patients living with diabetes, whether there are any plausible pathophysiologic mechanisms explaining why patients with diabetes or obesity would be at greater risk of infection or complications from SARS-CoV-2 infection. We'll then have a look at some data, both globally and some very early local data on the association of diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19. Uh, we'll have a look at some management principles of patients with diabetes that have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And then there's a miscellaneous group um, of issues that are put together that may or may not make an impact in patients that uh, um, have diabetes. So we've all been trained to expect a higher risk of infection in patients with type 2 diabetes. And there is in vitro data to explain uh, why this should be. Um, this picture sums up the effects of diabetes on multiple components um, of the immune system. Sorry, there's a little delay. Uh, which together with um, hyperglycemia and end organ dysfunction will place the patient with diabetes at a greater risk of infection. Um, and it's interesting that such dogmatically taught concept is not backed up in the literature by an overwhelming amount of robust data as there are some conflicting reports. Um, however, the data does trend um, to a greater risk of bacterial infections in patients with diabetes, especially of the bones, the joints, the skin, and surgical site infections. There's very little data to show an increased risk of viral infections. So there's quite a next one. But there is actually a reasonable amount of data to show that when a patient with diabetes does become infected, there is an increased morbidity and mortality for that patient. And there was a recent meta-analysis that showed that diabetics are at an increased risk of dying from an infection with a hazard ratio of 2.39. And if we look at over the last two decades, the last three um, serious significant virus eight outbreaks. Uh, the SARS outbreak in 2002-2003, diabetes was an independent predictor for morbidity and mortality. In the uh, influenza H1N1 outbreak in 2009, there was a threefold increased risk of hospitalization and a fourfold increased risk of intensive care admission in patients with diabetes. And the MERS outbreak in 2012, there were, diabetes was an independent predictor of mortality in these patients. And in diabetes, um, and the, the coexistence of sepsis and diabetes, um, the adaptive immune systems experience chronic derangements secondary to chronic inflammation. And when sepsis and diabetes are superimposed, it does seem that patients have an increased morbidity and mortality and the cause of this is actually not um, very well elucidated. There are unclear synergistic and antagonistic changes that occur that lead to a worsened immune system and the inability to then regain homeostasis. So if we have a look at whether patients with diabetes are an increased risk of ARDS, Next one. This was answered recently, um, published last year, a meta-analysis of 14 observational studies with a, uh, over 6,500 patients with acute lung injury and ARDS. And in this study, um, there was no statistically significant association between pre-existing diabetes and acute lung injury or ARDS. Also, there was no association with in-hospital mortality or 60-day mortality. So essentially no association between diabetes and the increased risk of um, ARDS. So if we now go on and have a look at whether there are plausible pathophysiologic mechanisms explaining why patients with diabetes would be at greater risk of infection or complications from SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, this picture everyone now um, knows quite well. 
Um, it shows the virus spike protein that uh, interacts with the ACE2 receptor to gain entry into cells. There's high expression of ACE2 uh, receptors in epithelial cells of the heart, the kidney, the lung, the adipose tissue, the mouth, the colon, the blood, gallbladder, and, and many other tissues. And just to say at this point that it has been shown that acute hyperglycemia has been shown to upregulate ACE2 expression on cells, possibly facilitating viral, virus entry into cells. And once a virus gains entry into the cell, there's a downregulation of ACE2. And if we have a look at what ACE2 does by converting angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1 to 7, if we have a downregulation of ACE2, there's a move towards a buildup of angiotensin 2, and then a movement down the pathway that ultimately results in increased hypertension, increased cardiac fibrosis, increased thrombosis, and a greater risk of ARDS. In the next slide, um, another uh, factor in, uh, important in diabetics is DPP-4 that has a, a, a significant role to play in the setting of um, glycemic control. Um, DPP-4 is a membrane-associated endopeptidase that's also been shown to be a functional coronavirus receptor. And this was shown in the MERS outbreak uh, where the MERS coronavirus uses DPP-4 to gain entry into cells. However, from my reading and, and what I've uh, managed to find, there's no evidence yet that uh, DPP-4 plays a role in uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, cell entry. So this slide puts together putative uh, mechanisms that may explain why someone with diabetes would be at increased susceptibility for COVID-19. So you have entries, entry of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the respiratory tract, infection of the respiratory epithelium, and then ultimately leading to a pneumonia and possible risk of ARDS. Lower down, you can see um, a dysregulated immune response um, from multiple components from the innate and adaptive immune system, um, all leading to the potential risk of a cytokine storm. And as already previously mentioned, in hyperglycemia, there's increased expression of ACE2, especially on the myocardium and the kidney, which may facilitate viral entry um, into the cells of these organs, thus affecting um, their function. And not to forget that all of this occurs in patients that are usually of an increased age. They usually have, um, uh, they're usually overweight or obese, and they more than likely have either diagnosed or undiagnosed pre-existing vascular disease or kidney disease. An interesting concept is whether infection with SARS-CoV-2 can actually cause diabetes. And this has come about because in the SARS outbreak, it was shown that its spike protein and interaction with the beta cell could damage that beta cell. And there was an increased prevalence of new cases of patients with diabetes um, after SARS-CoV infection. And there are reports um, from uh, many countries that have been hard hit by this pandemic that there are frequent cases of severe diabetic ketoacidosis, and that usually in patients with diabetes, massively increased insulin requirements are needed uh, to maintain euglycemia, possibly suggesting that they have a, had an increased loss of uh, beta cells. One of the most significant findings in endocrinology over the past three decades has been the fact that the adipocyte is an active endocrine organ and not just a storage depot for fat. It has receptors enabling it to respond to multiple stimuli, and it produces a significant amount of hormones, adipokines, and cytokines. Now, I know this next slide um, is complicated, but what I wanted to show here on the first part of the slide is that in healthy body weight conditions, the adipose tissue microenvironment is well vascularized and rich in anti-inflammatory cytokines. However, as someone gains weight, there's hyperplasia and hypertrophy of adipocytes. The vascular supply becomes limited and areas of hypoxia develop, leading to necrosis and apoptosis of cells. This then releases damage-associated molecular patterns into the microenvironment, 
which triggers the infiltration and activation of multiple components of the immune system, resulting in chronic pro-inflammatory environment. And here I would really like to emphasize the accumulations of cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, interleukin-1 beta, and IL-6. And it's important because IL-6 is important because it's a main cytokine um, suggested to be involved in the cytokine storm that's been reported in patients with COVID-19. So just to summarize this slide, um, in metabolic obesity, the adipocyte is in a pre-activated pro-inflammatory state. You can see from the next slide that um, all three of these disease entities but especially diabetes that's been quite well elucidated and central obesity have been shown to have a marked effect on the endothelium causing endothelial dysfunction. And it's this endothelial dysfunction, if you look in the center picture lower down, that ultimately results in the release of multiple cytokines giving rise to, and especially cytokine six, giving rise to a cytokine storm um, causing leaky capillaries and ultimately resulting in multiple organ failure. So just the next slide. Just not to forget that obesity um, is associated also with respiratory dysfunction. It has associated comorbidities, and it also has associated metabolic risk, all potentially together um, giving rise to a more severe course of COVID-19. And this slide is just something that I've put together, um, um, having a look at the main areas affected by COVID-19 and to show that obesity it's, itself can also affect these areas quite significantly. And so potentially the synergistic action of both of these on those systems uh, could potentiate uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection and lead to a more severe course of illness. And then lastly, uh, there are some that have described a pathway of SARS-CoV-2 through the body, ultimately resulting in a reservoir of virus in the adipose tissue. That's number six there, uh, resulting in viral shedding into the systemic circulation, immune activation, uh, cytokine amplification, and systemic tissue injury. So I hope over um, these past few slides have shown that there are potentially multiple synergistic pathways to which diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19 could interact uh, to cause a more severe disease path. So we're now going to have a look at some uh, global data on the association of diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19. And just at the outset to say um, that I did a... a, a a PubMed search yesterday just putting in COVID-19 and over 10 and a half thousand articles were retrieved. If you put in COVID-19 and diabetes, already over 250 articles um, appear in PubMed. But the important thing is that all are observational studies. And so whilst they might be able to show an association, we can't uh, ascribe any causation uh, to any of this yet. So what I first wanted to look at was whether there's an increased prevalence of diabetes in patients that are infected with COVID-19. Now, this is quite difficult information um, to find because what is needed is the number of patients with diabetes and who have COVID-19 over everyone that has COVID-19. Now, we know that the numbers uh, of asymptomatic disease are known. And then almost all articles report on hospitalized patients. But what I have been able to get, and I'd really like to thank Mary Ann Davies for this slide, who works together with Andrew Buell, um, showing uh, in the Western Cape, across the age groups, the number of COVID patient, patients and the prevalence of diabetes. And as you can see there at the moment, um, amongst all those infected, there's not a very high prevalence of diabetes. And if you have a look there in the Western Cape, um, the actual figures given to me by Marianne was that diabetes in the COVID-19 cases, the prevalence was 11.7%. And the background prevalence of diabetes in this population is 12.4%. So at the moment, 
the prevalence in COVID patients is below the background prevalence. The next one shows um, a meta-analysis of 12 studies reporting data from 2,108 Chinese patients. Um, and again here, the overall prevalence of diabetes in the COVID-19 population was 10.3%. And in the diabetic, the background uh, prevalence in the population of diabetes was 10.9. So basically very early data to suggest then that actually there's not an increased prevalence of diabetes in all of those that are infected with COVID-19. I just wanted to include this slide to show and to highlight the diabetes group that there's a very wide reported prevalence. And this depends on whether people, the studies reporting admissions to hospital, admissions to critical care, admissions to the intensive care unit, need for ventilation, um, and deaths. Okay, so if we have a look at the question whether patients with diabetes follow a more severe disease course, um, you can see here, this is a case series of 5,700 patients with COVID-19 that were admitted to 12 hospitals in New York and its surrounding areas. And here it was shown that 33.8% had pre-existing diabetes and 41.7% were obese. Now that uh, prevalence of diabetes is greater than their background population. Uh, I'm not certain of the background prevalence of diabetes in that population. And then of the patients who died, those with diabetes were more likely to have received invasive mechanical ventilation or care in the ICU compared with those who did not have diabetes. So in this slide, which comes from the Lombardy region in Italy, um, it's a retrospective case series of 1,591 consecutive patients um, you can see here the prevalence of diabetes was 17%, uh, which was above the background prevalence in the, in the community. This study is a, um, comes from China. It's of 7,500 patients who had been hospitalized at over 552 sites. And what you can see there, that the overall prevalence of diabetes was 7.4%, and this was essentially similar to the background prevalence. However, if you have a look at the more severe population, you can see that the prevalence of diabetics there doubles, suggesting then that diabetes, the patients with diabetes do have a more severe course um, of their illness. Oops. This is a large study from China looking at the outcomes of 72,314 patients. And here you can see the overall case fatality rate was 2.3%. But when they had a look at the case fatality rate by pre-existing um, comorbidity, you can see that there was a um, fatality rate of 7.3% for patients with diabetes, which was three times greater uh, than the overall case fatality rate. This study is a retrospective observational study of over 1,200 patients uh, in the United States at 88 um, hospitals. Um, and what this shows is that patients with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia had a far greater mortality than a patient with no diabetes or someone that had controlled glucose. The next question we need to ask is whether um, patients who are admitted or develop COVID-19, whether glycemic control actually matters. And here, unfortunately, the data is quite sparse, but I did manage to find this one study that again shows that um, in the first uh, graph on the left, that patients with type two diabetes have a greater mortality than patients without diabetes. But then in the graph on the right, it shows that those with poorly controlled diabetes had a significantly greater mortality than those with well-controlled diabetes. And in this study, they defined well-controlled diabetes as having glucose within the range of 3.9 to 10, 
and someone with poorly controlled diabetes having a, an excursion above 10. And this resulted in an 11% death rate. This is a, a retrospective study of 442 patients. It's small compared to the other ones I've presented, but this is the only study where I managed to find the, that they did a multivariate analysis. And this was on data obtained from an ele electronic health record of each patient. And what it clearly showed was that obesity um, had an odds ratio of 1.95, and a um, diabetic had an odds ratio of 1.77 of a more severe illness. And the interesting fact in, in this population was that both diabetes and obesity were more significant in those that were under 52 years of age. This is from the uh, CDC in the USA, where they send out a weekly summary of the uh, COVID-19 hospitalization data. Um, and this is data as of the 2nd of May. And it included about 8,000 patients. And here it showed a prevalence of metabolic disease of about 41.5% and obesity um, of about 49.8%. Now, there's no doubt that that 41.5% is above the background prevalence in the population. Um, the obesity is difficult because there are many populations that have obesity background um, of greater than 40 to 50%. Data from uh, the United Kingdom. This is the, a weekly report as well from the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center that uh, gets sent data from 289 participating centers. And they report all patients admitted to high care or the intensive care unit. And this was data as of the 7th of May, and it included about 8,250 patients. And you can see here that um, only, only from about the BMR of 30 to 35 does the uh, prevalence of obesity uh, increase beyond that of the background population, and especially in the, with a BMR of over 40, suggesting then in the UK that a BMR of over 35 um, spells a, a more severe course of COVID-19. This I included for interest, uh, because the, one of the questions would be is, does SARS-CoV-2 and uh, obesity or diabetes um, have a specific relationship completely different to any other viral infection, such that SARS-CoV-2 specifically in this population um, spells a more severe course? And so what they did here is they compared the um, patients with confirmed COVID-19. Sorry, Mark, just back, please. They compared the group with a suspected COVID-19 versus a group that they had admitted to ICU with a viral pneumonia. And if you have a look at the body mass index, it's not too different uh, in both cohorts, suggesting then that um, possibly, and obviously it's very early to say, um, obesity in the setting of SARS-CoV-2 infection does not behave any differently than in any other um, severe viral infection. This is data from France. Um, they did a similar study where they uh, uh, had a small cohort of SARS-CoV-2 patients, about 124, and they also compared them to non-SARS-CoV-2 controls that they had admitted to the ICU requiring ventilation. And here they did show a distinct difference um, in body mass index uh, in those requiring mechanical ventilation, uh, showing that those with a higher BMI in SARS-CoV-2 were the ones more likely to require ventilation. And this need for ventilation increased as your body mass index increased. So this is probably the largest um, analysis that we've had. It was published this week. Um, it's all adults currently registered in the um, UK as active patients in general practice in England as of the 1st of February, 2020. Um, and that 
who had also had at least one year of follow-up prior to uh, the 1st of February. And then the authors looked at all deaths as of the 25th of April. And so in this, they had about 17 and a half million patients. And of those patients, 5,683 had died from COVID-19. And you can see here quite clearly that, sorry, Mark, back, that obesity um, had a, a increased hazard ratio of uh, death from COVID-19. And this increased as your body mass index increased. It also showed that diabetes uh, was a, a marked risk factor for death from COVID-19, and especially um, if your diabetes was poorly controlled. And just to highlight at this point, um, the data that Andrew presented um, with us, um, that uh, uh, thus far there's been 40, 46 out of the 111 deaths in the Western Cape have been um, patients with diabetes. That's a prevalence of 41%. And very early evidence possibly to show that diabetics in the Western Cape have a fourfold increased risk of dying. This was a slide shown last week by uh, Mary Ann Davies, also showing quite clearly that although we haven't shown an increased prevalence of diabetes in the whole population of COVID-19, there's no doubt that um, it seems that uh, diabetes in our setting is also leading to a more severe course with more patients being admitted across all age groups um, who have diabetes. And as Andrew had presented, um, having a greater mortality. Okay, so let's go in and have a look at some of the management principles um, of patients with diabetes and COVID-19. Now, just to say at this time, there's no robust studies um, to guide us. Um, essentially, one would adopt usual methods that, uh, that one would uh, adopt in any setting of a diabetic who, who is infected. If we first start off with patients with diabetes who are not infected with SARS-CoV-2, I think at this point, it's quite important for them to intensify their metabolic control. Um, we've shown that patients with poorly controlled diabetes, although they may not be at greater risk of sustaining the infection, they are certainly at greater risk of having a more severe course. And so we should encourage them to really intensify their monitoring um, uh, and try and uh, maintain good glycemic control. If we have a look at people with diabetes that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and that are an outpatient, they can generally continue on their current therapy, but with meticulous monitoring and adjusting their medication to achieve their individualized glycemic goals. Um, it is important to note though that um, Many of them might have various degrees of dehydration and sepsis. So if they do have dehydration and sepsis, it's important to stop metformin. And it's probably, probably prudent in all patients, um, even as an outpatient, to stop the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitors can increase the risk of dehydration. They can increase the risk of a diabetic ketoacidosis. And then other groups of drugs, such as the GLP-1 analogs and the DPP-4 inhibitors can probably be continued, but with close monitoring. And there's no doubt that once a patient is admitted to hospital, um, in the ideal world, um, insulin is a treatment of choice. And especially in those that are critical or dehydrated, then intravenous insulin is probably best with very close monitoring of blood glucose and adequate titration to achieve um, glucose in hospital uh, of between roughly five and 10 millimoles per liter. If we go and have a look at a couple of miscellaneous factors that I've um, suggested, the effect of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, a very common drug uh, used by patients with diabetes. And much has been said about uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers possibly giving rise to a more severe course of, uh, of COVID-19 because of the upregulation of ACE2 receptors. This was just one publication. There's quite a few now, 
uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, essentially showing that any medication used for the treatment of hypertension is safe uh, in the setting of COVID-19. And the next study that comes from China, um, it was an outpatient study. Um, it essentially showed that those patients on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker have a lower mortality. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should put patients on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker to reduce mortality, but I think the importance here is that it did not increase mortality, uh, which was the expected outcome from uh, many, many investigators. And then lastly, just age and COVID-19. There's no doubt that data from around the world, um, and here I'm just showing in Italy and in China, shows that those with increasing age have increasing risk of more severe illness and uh, mortality, such that in those over 80, in Italy, there's a one in five chance of dying, and in China, there's a one in six chance of dying. So there's no doubt that with age, uh, COVID-19 disease is more severe. And if we plot this, this was just something I put together showing that with age, obesity, diabetes, thrombosis, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and pneumonia all increase with age, as does morbidity and mortality. And so being able to dissect out the individual, sorry, Mark, Let's go back one. So being able to dissect out the individual contribution of each of these um, to, or the independent contribution of each of these to the uh, severity um, of COVID-19 and the outcome is going to be very difficult. So then in summary, there's no data at this time to suggest that patients with diabetes or obesity are at an increased risk of infection with SARS-CoV-2. All published observational studies show an association between diabetes, obesity, and an increased morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. There's early data to show that controlling glycemia may improve outcomes in patients with diabetes. And there's no data yet to suggest that any management options, including ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers or DPP-4 inhibitors, will influence COVID-19 significantly. And at this stage, manage glycemia as per usual protocols for any patient with an infection, focusing on meticulous monitoring of blood glucose and titration of medication to achieve individual glycemic targets. So thank you, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Right. Thanks very much, Joel, for a really excellent talk. It was a, a comprehensive and, and multifaceted overview. And, and as you've pointed out, this is a, obviously um, a field where knowledge is, is advancing rapidly and there's a lot of unknowns, but to hear your insights as to what the likely mechanisms of pathogenesis and the epi your insights into the epidemiology and management is, is extremely useful for clinicians working on the ground. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, the panel discussion. And just to introduce the panel, uh, the three members of the panel, Sipad Lamini, who's an infectious disease specialist at Khoriskia, Anke Kutsia, the head of endocrinology at Stellenbosch University in Tigerberg, and uh, Peter Robenheimer, um, an endocrinologist and uh, head of general medicine at Khoriskia Hospital. So I'm going to ask uh, Sipo if uh, he can uh, make the first comments and, and if he's got any questions for Joel. Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham. Uh, thanks, Joel, for for that uh, overview of diabetes and uh, and, and 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 obesity, um, and really highlighting, I think, the 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 the, the risk of, of very severe disease. Um, uh, Joel, I think my question to you, uh, the first one, is that you've you've highlighted that um, uh, you know one of the mechanisms or the immunopathogenesis uh, uh, of, of, of the possibility of severe disease in especially obese uh, individuals is that uh, obesity is almost uh, or the adipocyte is a state of almost uh, chronic inflammation and um, one of the questions then just from a public health uh, given the fact that we know we've got a huge obese population 
certainly in, in, in our city and province, is whether you think uh, weight loss or exercise may assist in maybe changing the inflammatory milieu and, and possibly hopefully, hopefully uh, 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 abrogating some of the, the, the high risk of death from, from, from these populations. Do you have any comments on, on that? I know it's uh, uh, not much out there, but just your thoughts on you know, something like whether we say to these obese people, go outside and make sure you have a brisk walk exercise versus, um, versus um, um, weight loss. Thanks very much, Sipo. An excellent question. And I think, um, in, obviously, in the setting of COVID-19, all of that still needs to be shown. But there's no doubt in the setting of many other disease processes, um, and especially for diabetes and obesity in general, um, exercise, uh, diet, is, and weight loss is, is essential. And I think there's no doubt that when you see the, the uh, outcomes as per body mass index category, that if they could drop categories um, prior to getting infected with COVID-19, the outcome would probably be better. Obviously, all of this is observational data. So it's all an association. But I think uh, any excuse for recommending exercise and weight loss uh, in people that are overweight and obese uh, should be adopted. And then obviously, they should do it within the laws of our country. Uh, between six and nine in the morning uh, with a face mask. And I think, yes, I think we should be encouraging patients at this time to be active. We don't know how long this uh, process is going to be. And with the lockdown um, and the inability to really be very active, uh, people really need to adhere to um, very strict and meticulous lifestyle measures. Thanks, thanks, Sipa. Uh, I think that's a really important point that you've raised because it's not something that's coming out in the public discourse at the moment, is it? Uh, was, was there anything else, uh, Sipa, that you wanted to add? Yes, yes. Um, so the, the second question really is uh, 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 another issue that you, you you highlighted in your talk, but really uh, sort of uh, skimmed through. So you also uh, highlighted, I think, in your slides that the adipocyte may be potentially a reservoir for SARS-CoV-2. And, and this now brings in the question about obese uh, people infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2, that they may shed virus for longer, and whether we should be also suggesting a longer uh, isolation or quarantine for these people as opposed to, to thin to thin people. Uh, any comments on that, Joel? I know, again, this is not something where we're going to have any data, but uh, I think you presented a slide that uh, would suggest that uh, obese people may shed a virus for longer because you've got uh, the virus in all these uh, uh, adipose uh, tissues. Thanks, Sipo. Um, as you know, I mean, all of this is obviously in its very early stages. That was a hypothesis that was put forward by um, a group, I think in the USA, uh, trying to explain the predilection of SARS-CoV-2 for patients with diabetes and trying to explain, the, I mean, sorry, with obesity and trying to explain the more severe um, course of these patients. Um, you know, whether they have a prolonged, uh, a prolonged period of virus resident in their body um, may, or may or may not be, um, probably not infectious at that stage. Uh, so whether they have prolonged the effects of the virus, um, you know, one would have to wait and see and do specific studies looking at that. Um, but I don't think there's any data at this moment in time to suggest that all patients with, that are overweight or obese should have a much longer period of quarantine. Okay, great. Thanks, Joel. So it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, ask Anki, our colleague from Tigerberg, uh, to see if you've got any questions for Joel or any comments that you want to make. Yeah, thanks, Joel, for a very comprehensive talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, three questions from our side. When we look at the, the DOH figures, I'm wondering about the accuracy of the prevalence of diabetes. 
And I was hoping that you could share some of your thoughts on that. So a very good question, Anke. As you know, we don't have uh, very accurate recent uh, prevalence figures for the country and also for the Western Cape. Um, on my one slide there, I put up a figure that was put forward by the, uh, the International Diabetes Federation. And uh, they suggested from data that they obtained from around the country that we have a background prevalence of about 12.8%. And then we also know that uh, at least 50% of patients that are diabetic now don't yet know they're diabetic. So our background prevalence is probably higher than, than what we think. So I think when it comes to looking at the prevalence of diabetes in COVID-19, at the moment it's sitting at 11. That probably is quite accurate that it doesn't seem like diabetics have an increased risk of getting uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, the massively increased prevalence in those admitted and the mortality um, is also probably greater than our background prevalence even though we know our prevalence is inaccurate. It's probably inaccurate by about three or four percent, but it's, it's unlikely to be inaccurate by 10 or 20 percent. Um, I'm not sure if you agree. John, John can I just maybe, uh, and Anke, if, if Andrew's still on, on the call, if he wants to comment on the ascertainment of diabetes both in the province and, and among COVID uh, patients. Uh, th thanks, Graham. Uh, Marianne can also chip in. Um, she commented that the uh, ascertainment that we had from our routine data was much lower than uh, what was reported by the team that actually spoke to the clinicians who treated the patients um, who were admitted and died. And, uh, and uh, a large fraction of our patients who were part of the early cohort were patients who were tested and came from the private sector and we don't have any background data on them. So we wouldn't be able to compare um, prevalence of those admitted and dying compared to um, those being infected. And in the public sector, we're very reliant on uh, pharm pharm pharmacy and laboratory data. And uh, there's a definitely an under ascertainment and opportunity at the moment whilst we're doing individual case review for better ascertainment in those who um, have severe disease. So I, def I definitely concur that we may be um, have an ascertainment bias around uh, associations with severity, but that will, that will become a, a, over time, we, that will become less differential um, as we can no longer follow up individually on severe cases. Yeah. yeah. Anke, do you want to go on? Yeah. Thanks. I, I think just in terms of self-reported data, that is something we see at Tiger Bird. People often report that they do not have diabetes on admission. They might not have a particularly high blood glucose on admission, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the chronic glucose control. And we've been trying to, um, working with Joel, to sort of um, see if we can get HbA1cs in these patients to get a more accurate um, reflection of glycemia prior to hospital admission to take this bias that you've discussed out of out of the equation just a comment and then the next question Joel in some of the studies there's a significant increased duration of stay in people with diabetes in hospital and I was wondering if you could shed some light on how we could attenuate that, and if you think that's possible with adequate glucose control. Also another good question, uh, Ankia. Um, I managed to find one paper that showed that uh, you can change the course of the in-hospital stay by controlling glycemia, and by controlling it between 3.9 to 10. Uh, we would never suggest 3.9 to 10 because we know that hypoglycemia itself in hospital increases morbidity and mortality. So here at Hruduskia, what we're trying to do, we're trying to control the sugar between 5 and 10. Um, obviously, we need a lot more uh, well-powered studies to show whether we can actually change the outcome um, of patients with diabetes by controlling their sugar well. Um, there's early suggestions that that is possible and let's hope that it is possible. So it's another 
small little thing that we can do to hopefully help our patients uh, survive this, uh, this disease. And the practicalities thereof, and that's my last question, what would you suggest um, in terms of the practicalities and minimizing the use of PPE when we manage people with diabetes in hospital? So very difficult. Um, so as far as we can at the moment, um, our patients are getting sicker, but as far as we can at the moment, we're encouraging self-monitoring of their sugar and self-administration of their sugar. It obviously becomes a lot more difficult uh, when they're unable to do this, and it increases exposure of healthcare workers um, to the patient. Um, on, on the other side of that, the best way of uh, achieving good glycemic control is with frequent monitoring and frequent adjusting of insulin or, or giving of insulin dosages. Um, which then increases the exposure of healthcare workers to the patient. So it is a very difficult balance between trying to help the patient and at the same time uh, protect the healthcare worker. Um, unfortunately, as you know, there's no data of various types of regimens that we can use um, to achieve this. So basically what we're doing is we're using our usual care um, in sick, pa in sick pa diabetic patients that are ill. And as much as possible, trying to limit, if we can, uh, exposure of the healthcare worker to the patient. Yeah. Th does that include the use of GLAR gene as opposed to NPH human intermediate or long-acting insulin? We haven't, we haven't adopted a policy yet of routinely replacing the analogs, I mean the uh, human regular insulin with the analogs yet. Um, generally, the data has shown that they need very high, very high um, amounts of insulin. So I think we can get away with using the human insulin without causing hypoglycemia in these patients. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's a good way of starting. And then with frequent monitoring, one can see whether you need to either adjust the dosages or actually change uh, to analog insulin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ankia. Just on the last point, Joel, you, you have put together a, a useful one-page uh, guideline for use at Kroniski, and it might be an idea that we uh, post that on the Department of Medicine website alongside your webinar uh, that people could access. And so, sure. the, yeah, perhaps we can do that uh, later this week. Um, so then uh, to move on to uh, uh, my colleague from Kroniski, Peter Robenheimer. Peter, have you got any questions uh, or comments that you wanted to make? Yes, hi, thanks. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Joel. Maybe just uh, while we're discussing ascertainment of diabetes, you know, both, both to Joel and our, our colleague across the Lisbeck, an, an important uh, subgroup is, of course, healthcare workers uh, with diabetes and those who don't know they have diabetes. I, I think we should just point out that there's an important uh, exercise here, perhaps, to have our healthcare workers screened for diabetes. Um, as I'm listening to this, I think that, you know, obviously they're at risk and they should know and they should control themselves. I think it's something we should maybe think about undertaking. But, but let, me, let me put some practical questions to Joel. I mean, Joel, Joel I think, you know, this, this hyperglycemia that people present with is really important, you know, because of, as you pointed out, the cytokine storm and the, maybe even the pancreatitis that's, that's part of that. And a major feature is some people needing huge insulin doses, but, but a very common clinical problem that people have to deal with. And so, you know, we've suggested we, we put them on insulin, but, but, but I, I want to ask you, how, how do you think about discharging these patients? You know, I have a large cohort of patients, some with undiagnosed previous diabetes, some with probably not diabetes, or had severe hyperglycemia during this. And are you planning a discharge process and a follow-up uh, in the middle of COVID-19? Maybe you can tell clinicians how you think about that and how we should safely do that. Thanks, Peter. Very difficult. Start off with a very difficult question. I mean, clearly the patient with diabetes that is discharged, that uh, already knows how to monitor, how to administer insulin, and how to have some preliminary dose adjustments of the insulin is easier than the newly diagnosed patient with diabetes that has to be discharged on insulin. Uh, because that patient then has to go and self-isolate um, with his or her insulin and glucometer and may or may not know exactly how to use it. So it is difficult. So at the moment, what we are trying in the ward, we've only had one patient 
and we managed to luckily control that patient on oral therapy. So what we're going to be trying to do is to encourage nursing staff and doctors to educate patients whilst they on administration of insulin and monitoring whilst they're here in the, um, in the ward. And then we are bringing them back to our diabetic clinic quite soon after they exit um, their self-isolation or quarantine. <clears throat> we haven't unfortunately yet developed a, a, a reasonable practical method of what to do with them uh, during their self-isolation. Um, we've been sending patients that are stable to Lagoon Beach and they self-isolate there with no medical care. They get given food, but there's no observations or help with uh, glucose monitoring or um, insulin adjustment. And I suppose here we might need to incorporate uh, telemedicine uh, in some way or another uh, with those patients on a daily basis to try and help them through their isolation process. Uh, whilst they're learning to, to manage and become accustomed to their diabetes. But it is difficult. Um, I don't know what Anki is doing at uh, Tigerberg uh, with the newly diagnosed patients that are being discharged uh, for self-isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel, maybe those are the, the perfect first clinics to open again at Kretisky Hospital. Th 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 those for patients who've already had COVID. Agreed. And that's what, that's what we're we sort of doing with diabetes is that obviously our diabetic population are at great risk. So our clinics are closed. Um, we're not 100% sure when they're going to open because they're at great risk of a um, you know, complicated course of COVID. But the ones that have already had it, uh, we're going to start being seen hopefully quite soon. Um, so I agree. And I think across the board, that could be a paradigm to follow, uh, that the first clinic's the first patients you start seeing in your clinics are again, again are those that have already had COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I don't know the answer to that. And certainly that's not something that is happening at the moment. Um, some of our older clinicians that are not able to actually work on the front line are manning the diabetes clinic at Tigerberg at the moment ensuring patients have adequate medication, communicating with them via SMS, telephone, calls and email and so forth. But certainly, I mean, the bigger concern for me at the moment is that we've seen, you know, a much higher rate of diabetic ketoacidosis um, with pre-existing diabetic patients that are not accessing the insulin, et cetera, et cetera. And I think from a tertiary prevention point of view, that's where we are focusing our resources at the moment. Those COVID negative patients, Ankya? Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's been highlighted around the world that non-COVID related illnesses are obviously taking a, a backseat um, and patients can't get access to medication um, and are reducing their medication to make their medication last. Um, and here we have to commend our Minister of Health who signed a document allowing automatic renewal of prescriptions. So I think now that any patient um, whose prescription expires can go to their, either their pharmacy or their day hospital and it will be automatically renewed for another six months. So I think that's enabled access to a lot of patients uh, to continue their medication and hopefully to reduce um, the need for uh, at being seen at by a doctor or um, access or a emergency unit. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, just I, I think we just about run out of time. We're just a bit over. Um, there's just one question that Ked and Data sent through to me, and if you can just give a, a short answer to it. Um, it, the issue of anticoagulation. Is there any differential guidelines in diabetic patients? A good question. We know that uh, we've discussed it on our COVID rounds, uh, that it seems that uh, the, the need for, for uh, anticoagulation in, the, in more severely ill COVID-19 patients is required. Uh, we also know that in the setting of diabetes, there's an increased risk for uh, coagulation problems in the risk of obesity, and especially now that they're ill, septic, dehydrated, and sedentary. Um, so I can't uh, answer Kirtan in general on the, on the, un, on the stable uh, diabetic patient, but certainly in the setting of COVID-19, there's an increased risk of pulmonary emboli, um, 
and we will probably soon be adopting an approach of uh, fully anticoagulating uh, most of the hypoxic patients, uh, regardless of whether they have obesity um, or diabetes. Uh, but certainly DVT prophylaxis um, should be instituted in all patients admitted uh, to the wards. Right. Thanks very much, Joel. I, th I think we've run out of time. Um, it's been a really excellent session. Uh, both talks from, from Andrew and Joel are really giving us great insights into this uh, condition from different angles. Uh, and then a great panel discussion. So I want to thank the, the three panel members as well. I think it's a very engaging discussion. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm uh, just going to wrap up today's session and say that we will be having uh, a talk next week from a colleague in, uh, who's been on the front line in New York City. Uh, describing some of the clinical issues and, and service issues there and we'll send out the send out the advert uh, around the weekend so i'm um, going to hand back to mark um, to to wrap up thank you graham and we'll see you next week and uh, as usual the recording uh, will be made available uh, on the uct website it's just coming up on your screen at the moment uh, you should be able to see that and uh, we'll be same time same place next week thank you very much Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. And thanks, Andrew, and the panel. Thanks.